Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo, and welcome to video number 67 and audio season 3, episode 32 of Music Is Not a Genre. Each week I take a release from my collection, I discuss it, I give you my take on it, I throw in some interesting tidbits and facts and opinions, and I connect it to my music, other music, and other things in the world. Thank you, as always, to everybody who is a subscriber. If you are watching now or listening, anyone who reads the text, if you're a reader, clicks the links, checks out the information on the bands I talk about, and especially clicks the links at the bottom to the music that I'm sharing, uh, if you are sharing with anybody else. And of course, to all of my Patreon patrons, thank you, especially to all of you. Appreciate that very much, as always. Let's get right to it. This week's topic is the Grey Album, sampling, bootlegs, mashups, and a Beatles time twist. There's a lot of mystery and discovery in this week's uh, podcast. I'm really excited about this. This week when I started, it's been busy. It's been very busy. The world is opening up again and there are things happening all over the place. So I was a little distracted. I wasn't sure what to do next. I had a couple of options and this one rose to the top. And I love this album. I've been interested in it. It is, uh, for those of you who can't see what I'm talking about, it is this here, Danger Mouse's The Grey Album. And we're going to talk about that in detail. Uh, And I, you know, loved it, but didn't know really what I was going to say until I started researching it. And then a lot of stuff popped up. But before I get to that, let me talk a little bit about music creation in general. Okay. I'm currently reading a book called Last Night a DJ Saved My Life, named after the song, and it's, it's a history of DJing, uh, both radio DJing and live DJing, starting as far back as 1906. It goes before that, but that's the first year that uh, anyone ever DJed uh, officially. And one of the points that was made is that there are all kinds of performers and that you may not think of DJs in this way, but if done well, a DJ is a performer of a certain kind. A DJ is not creating new music, but a DJ is creating a new experience. So I thought about that in the context of this here, this album here. And uh, if you know anything about it, you kind of get a hint from the title. It's a mashup, and we're gonna talk about it in detail a little later. And the idea is it takes pre-existing material, creates something new. And my point here is that there are lots of ways to create art of all kinds. Let's specifically talk about music. Lots of ways to create music. Uh, The conventional wisdom, a phrase I really can't stand because it's rarely wise uh, and, uh, and or true to any great extent, is that Music is created uh, uh, through an instrument, through vocals, uh, written on a page, through composition, uh, based in, it, uh, you know, tonal chord structure or atonal and all the various, you know, you know, permutations of how you can create music in that way. And that's it. It's all rhythm, all the elements of music. Uh, no, that's one way. That's one. That's many. That's a collection of ways to create music. You can create something new out of pre-existing material. Uh, You can put together, think of collage art, things like that. You can put together items that that already exist, but put put them together in a way that creates something that has never existed before. And that's what we're gonna talk about this, uh, this week. Starting with, just like the title says, number one, sampling, okay? So I'm going to give you a bit of conventional wisdom, hint, hint. Sampling began in the 1980s and uh, took the world by storm. It was invented by hip hop artists and it uh, completely lacks creativity. Well, okay, I gave it away there. No, none of that is true. None of it. The first... Uh, instance of sampling was in the 1940s where composers, music creators uh, of a type of music then, a type of postmodern music uh, uh, called musique concrète, uh, look it up, put together music using 
pieces of tape spliced from other pre-existing music. And that's the first instance of uh, sampling, proto-sampling, you could call it. The term sampling was coined in the 1970s electronic music uh, coming to the, you know, coming to the fore in the underground, at least in many ways. But of course, when electronic music took the world over in the 1980s, sampling made its popular music debut in, uh, in hip hop, although not only in hip hop, there were other bands such as Pop Will Eat Itself and other, um, a, a Big Audio Dynamite and bands like that, that used uh, sampling in their work and the great thing about that era of sampling, a couple of great things. One is it was so new that people didn't know what to do with it. They were blown away by it. And of course you had the naysayers, you know, as I said, who said it's not uh, creative, it's, it's stealing, et cetera, et cetera. I've talked so much about the difference between, you know, actual appropriation of someone else's music or quote unquote borrowing and the, the thing is, 99.999999% of all music in the world borrows, steals outright often. And if it's done in a creative way, creates something new. Sampling is an example of this. Um, the other thing that's great about sampling from the 1980s is that the music industry hadn't caught up with it yet. And, you know, I'm of two minds about this. The first mind is... Um, it was cool that artists could sample whatever they wanted and create beats and other, you know, uh, uh, you know, chordal patterns and things behind what they were doing without having to worry about royalties because it didn't cost those artists any money and they could make music for cheap, which, you know, is often very important for artists because artists don't have a lot of money. On the other hand, somebody created that work. So eventually the music industry caught up and established rules for sampling. You could not use a pre-existing recorded work without permission and all of that stuff. And I think that that, is a, that was a good move. But it was exciting in the 80s to hear all these samples coming from everywhere because people could do that. Why? Because people were doing it live. People were doing it in DJ sets. Uh, uh, you know, hip hop artists, DJs would, uh, you know, mix samples on top of beats for MCs and things like that. Uh, that's kind of a quick history of, of sampling. So what happened then was, of course, once you couldn't use samples uh, free anymore, you either had to not use them at all, create your own the way the Beastie Boys did and, and other artists, but in particular, the Beastie Boys did this kind of awesome thing where they recorded some music as if it was old music and then, and then used a portion of that as a sample to embed in the in the actual song that they were creating, and they did an entire album like this, like all this stuff was just it was you know, awesome. The, you know the way they got around that, but the second way you get around it is to just release the music for free because the issue here is if you're using someone else's music, you can't make money from it, so release it for free. And that brings us to this week's album, Danger Mouse's The Gray Album, which was released. In 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2004, Danger Mouse started a few years before then, but it was this album, the Grey album, that really kind of catapulted him to fame. And it's because it's creative genius, first of all, but there's a reason, uh, you know, another reason why, and it's because he used two extremely popular albums, Jay-Z's The Black Album, which if you can see the cover here, that's who's in the front, the illustration. And uh, the Beatles, The Beatles, which is nicknamed The White Album. That's how we know it. And put those two together, used the raw or the uh, isolated vocal tracks from the Black Album and the instrumental tracks from the White Album, also some vocals in the back there, created put the black and the white together, created the gray album. Knew that he couldn't actually release this for money, so he just released it online for free. So first of all, you can't find this on any streaming service and you probably never will. I would almost guess never. Some people, some kind people have posted it on YouTube, but for those of you who can see me, and if you can, I will describe it. Yeah, this is not a real CD. You're, you know, you're thinking, well, how did I get this CD? I couldn't have bought it. 
It's not a real CD, it's one of those thin cases, right? And what I did was I simply just took a piece of paper, paper and printed the picture that came along with the posting that Danger Mouse did, Brian Burton, for those of you who don't know his real name, and I also put the list of songs here on the other side, which are the titles of Jay-Z's Black Album songs, and in parentheses, the titles of the Beatles songs he used to uh, you know, lay under the Jay-Z's vocals. And then I took a normal CDR and a Sharpie, The Grey Album, Danger Mouse, Jay-Z, The Beatles, and wrote it by hand. So this is a bootleg. And that's all, they, you know, this is the only way this will ever exist is in a bootleg. Bootlegs are vitally important, not just from the live show bootlegs that we get, but also to be able to release music that you could not get clearance for, uh, that you'd have to pay royalties on and couldn't afford it. Uh, you know, the internet has made this extremely easy to do. Now there are, and we're getting to the next part, mashups all over the place in the internet because of how easy it is to do that, because of how easy it is to get the materials. Uh, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So, yes, this is a mashup of those two albums, Jay-Z's The Black Album, The Beatles, The Beatles, uh, a.k.a. The White Album. And uh, it was the first mashup ever. And eh, wrong. Again, no, it wasn't. Um, not by a long shot, actually. It was one of the very small handful of mashups that at the time in the early 2000s brought mashups to the forefront in a lot of uh, music, uh, both recorded and live. Good example, um, you know, recording uh, the, you know, internet, YouTube debuted uh, another year or two after uh, this album and people could put together the songs that they had in ways that you wouldn't think of. They hear similarities, one song or another. There's a guy out there now on Instagram, and I think maybe TikTok, who's doing that, who finds you know, brilliant combinations of songs that you wouldn't think would go together, crossing over genres, especially in the way that the Grey Album does. And then there's the live version of this mashup where you're singing, let's say, uh, portions uh, like lyrics to one song or the melody of one song over top of another song. And a couple of years after, again, the Grey Album, the, the TV show Glee did this all the time. And they picked it up from other people in the world doing it. And it's been a thing ever since. So almost 20 years now, mashups have been something that people have done to kind of get out their creativity in a in a you know way that's uh, un unorthodox. It's not that unorthodox anymore, but according to you know music traditionalists, yeah, it's unorthodox. But the thing is, uh, mashups didn't start anywhere near the time of this album here or that period. And this is where the Beatles time twist comes in. This is where I was like, all right, this podcast is just going to be. Cool from beginning to end because the things I discovered disabused me of notions, such as quick rundown. Sampling didn't start in the 1980s. It had been around since the 1940s. Um, you know, bootlegs exist for many reasons, not just because people want to hear live shows of the million Grateful Dead or Pearl Jam shows out there or fish, but because it's a way to release material for free that you wouldn't otherwise get out to the public. Mashups did not start in the 1990s or 2000s, the first mashup, people believe, the, the, when it was basically invented, on recording anyway, was by a guy named Harry Nilsson, very well-known singer-songwriter, who was friends with the Beatles, and by sheer coincidence, a recording he put out in 1967 mashed up his music with the Beatles music. So here you have this incredible time twist where more than 35 years before the Grey Album comes out, in which Danger Mouse uses Jay-Z and the Beatles, the very first mashup ever was Harry Nilsson and the Beatles. The Beatles at the time were also getting heavily into what? Sampling. Think of a song like Tomorrow Never Knows where they spliced the tape from various, uh, 
uh, you know, music scores for carousels and, and other things and, and, and other sounds and other types of music to create that bed of music for Tomorrow Never Knows or Revolution 9, which was just, you know, uh, some live performance, but with a bunch of samples. And those weren't the only two uh, at a time when Harry Nelson was essentially inventing the mashup. So somehow the Beatles are tying in to all of these things, to all to all of these things, which I just thought was kind of cool. Um, and that's, you know, that shows how you can break through restrictive notions about creativity, whether that has to do with the idea of the sample itself is not is not new and it is not creative, but how a sample is used can be very creative. You know, a mashup, the things you're mashing up are not new, but the way you mash them together creates something new. And that is, that is artistic creation. That is music creation. And, you know, let me tell you, just looking at the uh, track listing for this, just so I can talk about the music, actually, I, I remember in particular, and I, I heard this, of course, when it came out often, and then I heard it again, I listened to it again earlier this year, to play it for somebody else because of how much I love it. I remember uh, nine, the 99 Problems mashup with Helter Skelter, Dirt Off Your Shoulder mashup with Julia being two of my favorites, but then also Change Clothes with, with Piggies. Wow, like just wow. Uh, Moment of Clarity with Happiness is a Warm Gun was also kind of awesome. And Kind of a beautiful mashup, December 4th, Jay-Z's song with Mother Nature's Son. Oh man, just the way he uses uh, that sample from Mother Nature's Son and loops it, pretty damn cool. But Encore, that's probably to me, it's the third track, but I think it's really kind of where the album kicked off for me when Encore, Do You Want More, was mashed up with both Glass Onion and Savoy Truffle. Mm -mm. Man, I mean, psychedelic and trippy, and and funky and hip hoppy and rock and just all this stuff put together, and then just to finish this out, first song, public service announcement, uh, mashed with long, long, long. What more can I say? Mashed with while my guitar gently weeps. Uh, going down, we did four, five, six, seven, and eight, uh, seven. We talked about allure mixed with dear prudence, justify my thug mixed with rocky raccoon interlude mixed with revolution nine, and I'm so tired. And my first song mixed with Can You Take Me Back and Savoy Truffle. And Can You Take Me Back is kind of a tag of a song at the end of another song on the White Album. I forget which one. You guys can comment and remind me what it is. Um, but yeah, just incredible. Just incredible. I recommend you find this and listen to it. Um, as I said, sampling's been around for a long time. It's It's not something that I do as an artist. I don't take samples from other works to create new works. There was something I was working on years ago that I never finished that uh, was gonna be kind of a Bulgarian choral sample and I was gonna do that, but it never, I never finished that. Uh, but the idea of mashing together snippets of other material to create a new song or to enhance a new song or mashing together two types of songs, two types of genres, two different kinds of music to create something new. Those are things that have fascinated me for a really long time, starting with uh, my first uh, kind of quote unquote official demo in uh, 1992, the Reflections demo, where I did a song called Voices in My Head that was 26 tracks of my voice creating all of the instruments and all of the, of course, vocals and backup vocals and the rhythms and all of that stuff. And in there, I created a sample, uh, in a sense, where I was repeating certain phrases in both the left speaker and right speaker that were mimicking actual samples, but it was me creating the samples the way the Beastie Boys did. And, you know, and then I kind of didn't do much of that at all for a really, really long time. And then recently, as you see, if you read the text, the link to this song, I put out a song called The Power of Repetition Everlasting, from my band Rex album, Syncope for the Weird. Find it everywhere, especially find it on recarea.bandcamp.com, but you can find it on any streaming service, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, 
title, all of that stuff. And it uses three, uh, I believe three sound clips as part of the rhythmic and music bed for this song. And of course repeats them thus, you know, part of the idea of the power of repetition. And one of those samples was me making a weird sound with my mouth. So yes, confession, I created it. It's not an actual thing from another recording. Uh, another one was a sound I captured, and I talked about this in another podcast, on the subway, a guy playing a ukulele, and he played the same damn thing over and over and over the entire ride, and probably for much, much more before and after I was on that train. So I recorded it and used that and pitched it in a slightly different way and, 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 and fixed up the rhythm, and that became part of the rhythmic bed, uh, and a little bit as far as some, you know, uh, some music, some some no, actual notes in there. And then I was working on somebody else's music and accidentally sped up a piece of it that was unintended and I loved how it sounded, so I clipped that and used that as a sample. And it was like a little piano flourish. In fact, that's the thing that kicks off the entire song. So there are a couple actual samples in there along with the, some fake samples and I used that as, you know, again, to kind of pepper the song and, and to enhance the rhythm and the music bed for this song, Power of Repetition Everlasting. And I think that's as close as I've ever gotten to using and doing actual samples. Um, but boy, I, if I listen to music all over the place that has used samples from very famous, you know, works of all kinds, and that's kind of what's cool, you can take a jazz or funk or classical or hard rock thing and put it into a hip hop song and make it work. It's something that, again, has been going on for 30, 35, 40 years, you know, maybe not 40, but close to that. Uh, and the power of repetition ends up being this song that mixes hip hop and pop and psychedelia and avant garde and, you know, funk and all that stuff to create whatever you would call the song that it is now. And I urge you to listen to it because I think you'll enjoy it and you'll kind of understand what I'm talking about quite a bit. And then go listen to the Grey album because it is worth every minute and every second and kicked off the career of Danger Mouse who went on to collaborate with CeeLo Green in and create the group Gnarls Barkley, to collaborate with James Mercer of The Shins to create the group Broken Bells, to to collaborate with the recently late, sadly, MF Doom to create the band Danger Doom. And as recently as 2019, collaborated with Karen O oh of the AAS to put out uh, their uh, album, which was pretty awesome. He's a guy, as you can see, who likes, uh, you know, is near to my heart because he likes to do one of the things I like to do, which is put together types of music that shouldn't go together. and. That's why most of what he's done has been, have been either collaborations or producing for other bands like Portugal The Man and so, 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 so many others. Um, worth looking up as an artist in his own right, not just for the Grey album, uh, though that qualifies as him being an artist in his own right too. That's the whole point I'm making here. Uh, do you remember this album? Do you remember when it came out? Do you remember how at the time streaming didn't really exist so to speak i think i believe there might have been an itunes by then i don't remember when itunes started it was it before 2004 but i know that at that time you had um you know the tricklings of napster you know, dying out and limewire and frostwire and places where you could get your own bootlegs of music or on people's websites directly before youtube existed and 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 uh I don't know when SoundCloud started, but things like that. Uh, do you remember how, you know, what the, kind of how revolutionary it was at the time and controversial in some ways? Do you remember how the TV show Glee used to mash together two songs into a kind of a new performance? Uh, are there any other mashups that you ha enjoy that I don't know about? Because I don't know about a whole lot of them. Uh, are there are there albums or songs that have sampled things like Funky Drummer and things like that, are very famous samples, um, you know, or mimicked as if to sample the way Apache did for an older song, uh, the, the hip hop song Apache did for an older song Apache, uh, things like that, uh, that have, you know, co-opted in very creative ways, pre-existing material. Let me know about that. Let's talk about that. 
Uh, or do you believe, or do you hate all this? Do you believe that all music should just be completely from 100% new elements? Just nothing, use nothing that has ever existed before, if that's even possible. Uh, hint, hint, it's not. Uh, create, to create what you're creating. Is that what you feel? If so, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to hear if, if you completely disagree with everything I'm saying here, if you agree with it. If you know this album, if you don't know this album, I don't, I don't care what your opinion is other than that you share it with me because as always, my objectives here are music, conversation, and connection. Thank you so much for listening and watching and reading and clicking and listening again and reading again and sharing and subscribing and being my loving patron. And I will talk to you next time.